Hello and welcome to this answers video. In the previous lesson, we learned how to set up and solve a model for requested results using PyMapedia. We also looked at creating hard points and extracting the strain data for the touchscreen model. Now let's take a step further to understand how the class pools works in PyMapedia. Ready? Let's get started. If you recall in the lesson one of this course, we discussed an example where AI best algorithm is trained to read zip codes on main letters. And we also discussed how training a model on a large and varied data set can improve its accuracy. We witnessed how such large data sets or synthetic data sets can be created using PyME period. But now, you might wonder, to extract such varied range of outputs, our model should be tested for a different set of unique input data. One might say, it might take him days to compute this rigorous analysis by discreetly solving each model with a unique input from the set. But what if I tell you there is another sophisticated and robust technique to address this concern? If you recall, we had discussed a class in PyMEPDL which is extremely helpful when you need to run multiple instances of MEPDL in parallel or distribute the computational load across the course. This is known as pools. By creating multiple pools, you can distribute workloads across different ANSYS MEPDL instances which can significantly speed up the execution of commands. Each pool can be assigned a specific number of processors or cores to utilize. We refer to a computer that is running the PyMEPDL script as the local computer. But this does not limit us to the local machine. The pool could be one or more instances of MEPDL running as a service on one or more remote computers in addition to the local computers. Let us get back to our touchscreen model to see how we can take the advantage of local MEPDL pool methods in PyMEPDL to locally launch multiple instances of MEPDL as a service. We begin by launching the pools. There are two ways of dealing with pools. One, pre-create a set of input files, then use the local MEPDL run batch to auto-send the input files to the pool instances. One input file will be sent to each pool instance and once the instance is finished with the input file, a new input file will be automatically sent. This repeats until the list of input files is executed. The other, we define a Python function that encapsulates the entire MEPDL FEM needed to be run. Also create a list of unique inputs needed to be solved. Then use local MEPDL map to send each pool instance a unique set of inputs for the function to evaluate. The function can be defined to return some results. This can be gathered together. Then a set of inputs sent to available pool instances repeats until list of unique inputs is exhausted. We will follow the second word and let's now get to the code. Local MEPDL class includes the same set of command line arguments as the standard launch MEPDL, but also includes some argument unique to pools. The first one being the number of instances to launch. Here we will use three. We will also use the progress bar to the default value, which is true to visualize the same. Having defined the number of processes to be used running locally, let's move further. In case you have missed the previous video and are just curious about the pools, no worries. We will quickly walk you through the code, but we highly recommend you to go through the previous lesson. In contrast to the previous video, this time we will define the model using a function definition which makes it easier to interact with pools. Let us define the function model with the variables length, height, material property, section data, etc. and define them with respective inputs. Now, having created a rectangular area of 4.5 by 2 inches with fillets and defined sensor locations, we move further to define the material property along with the element type and the hard points as we defined in the previous lesson. As seen in the previous video, now we will go on to define the mesh attributes. We will use the triangular 2D elements, also known as trias. Mesh being one of the fundamental in governing FEA solution accuracy, it is quite important to have an effective mesh. Thus, we will opt for a mesh refinement in our touch grid model. This loop iterates over a range and performs refinement of mesh elements at specific nodes. It uses the code line queries.node to retrieve the node ID based on the X and Y coordinates from the sensor dictionary. Then the n-refine method is used to refine the elements around that node. 
Let us now define a component called sensor, which will contain the respective nodes. Thus, we use the loop function to select the respective nodes based on the coordinates from the previously defined sensor dictionary and redefine the component name sensor. Having completed the preprocessing, we will now close the prep7 command and move towards defining the solution set using slash solu command. Let's define a load in the z direction, fz, with a magnitude of 1 on the specific node id. To consider the geometric nonlinearities in the model, set the NLGM to on. We now solve the model and exit the solution stage. Let us now move to the post processing stage using the command post1 to post process the results using the database processor. We will define a dictionary called results, which will contain the output of the simulation and various results such as load values and strain values. To get the same, for loop is quite helpful as seen from the code. Do you remember the output from the code used in the previous lesson? Point.csv file containing the coordinate data for all the defined points on the touchscreen model. Let's import the same, but for that, we need to import the CSV module, which provides us with functionality to read and write the comma separated value files. We will create an empty list called inputs, which we will use to store the input data for the simulation. Open the file point.csv in the read mode and iterate over its content using CSV dot reader function. Each line in the CSV file is split into two individual values using the specified delimiter comma. The values are then converted to floating point numbers and added to the input list as cubules. Now, to arrange this data in a presentable and distinguishable form, we will define the headers that will serve as a structure to the data frame. These data frame will contain keys representing different result types such as load values and strain values. The corresponding values are empty lists. Now, import the pandas library and create a data frame called data1 using the header dictionary as the structure. Pandas, if you are not familiar with, is an open source library built on the NumPy library that provides various data structures and operations to manipulate the numerical data. The variable output uses the map method of the pool object to apply the model function to each input in the list. It executes the function in parallel, which is the basic functionality of pool's object, to return a list containing the value of the model function. The argument progress bar equals to true and wait equals to true enable a progress bar and wait for all the tasks to complete before continuing. Let's create a data frame called data2 using the output list generated from the parallel execution of the model function. We will concatenate data1 and data2 vertically, which results in combined data frame. Lastly, we will save the combined data frame data1 as a pickle file name resultdataall.pkl. The pickle file allows for efficient storage and retrieval of complex data structures in Python. Now we will exit the pool with the command line pool.exit. With this, we have reached to the end of this video and course. To make sure you really understand the material, try out the shared workshop files and the course quiz. This will help you to grasp the content better. I hope you find this video helpful. If you want to learn more, check out the other valuable resources on courses.answers.com. See you soon.